Tassa Pago Ato Arahato Sumha Sumbudasa Namo Tassa Pago Ato Arahato Sumha Sumbudasa Namo Tassa Pago Ato Arahato Sumha Sumbudasa Budang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami So in monasteries, there's a pretty traditional pattern of new, newly ordained postulants dealing with hindrances in a specific order. Generally, the first month or so is uh, dominated by kama chanda or sensual desire. And there's a famous story of a, uh, an anagarika, a postulant who went to ordain at Wat Pananachat in Thailand before learning that they didn't have donuts at Nanachat ever. And he went up to the abbot at the time and said, I don't think I can ordain here if there's no donuts, and promptly left. And I think the irony is next week they actually got donuts somehow. <laughs> but what happens after that is generally about three or four years, at least, of anger. And there's a almost cliched saying at this point that as a young monk, half of the world's suffering comes from the person's, the guy sitting next to you. And there's something very powerful hidden here in that so many of the teachings we hear coming to Buddhism love to focus on the bright and the dazzling aspects of loving kindness practice and the brighter states of which we hope we can embody the majority of the time. And there's a place for that. Those are beautiful things to aspire to. And yet the risk is that we miss the sweeter entryway into all the Brahma Viharas, the boundless states of loving kindness, through the doorway of real compassion, which is always touched first and foremost through our own suffering and stress. And this compassion that begins humbly in the broken state we all find ourselves and our lives and our families and our parents and our children in is where true majesty of spirit hides. And all too often, we want to skip over this encouragement towards the first noble truth of comprehending, touching, understanding the shape of our own suffering onto perhaps something more aligned with the fourth noble truth of the path of developing this path of sort of shooting meta rays out at all these people who need it so badly. And we miss, we miss our own brokenness. And when we miss that, we lose the doorway into something far more sweet, far sweeter, more beautiful and full of humility. People often feel that that first noble truth is a, a negative or a pessimistic articulation, such as life is suffering. But really, it's an encouragement in the canon to comprehend one's suffering. There's a task. And when one of my favorite ways of thinking about this was a uh, man who asked a teacher in Idaho, um, giving a retreat in Sandpoint, after he'd talked about this first task to comprehend suffering or stress, the man said, oh, it's like telephone poles. And the teacher said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I used to work installing telephone poles. And the foreman said, if this pole begins to fall, which way do you run? 
And initially I said, away. And the foreman said, no, you run right to the pole and put your hands on it because that's where you can feel which way it will go. And this is our orientation towards our pain and our imperfection is there's not a neutral stance. Either we are fleeing from it or carefully, intentionally, compassionately feeling its shape. And so much of practice is stopping long enough to let ourselves listen to and see those voices which have been wanting to be heard for so long, the bruises, the disappointments, the angers, the uglier, quote unquote, parts of ourselves that when looked at in the light of compassion, really aren't ugly. And practice can become one more tool to run. It can become that form of spiritual bypass. And this is especially dangerous with metta because there is this temptation to jump right into this bright spreading of loving kindness and miss the fact that really what we need at that point, first and foremost, is to hold ourselves with compassion and to listen to our own suffering for a time. Not necessarily with a bright glow or a smile on our face, maybe just to listen to our own suffering and bruises. One quality of the Dhamma is uh, opanayiko, which alternatively means leading onwards and leading inwards. And I think often we, the Dhamma encompasses both of these meanings. Sometimes we do lead, it leads us onwards into new action or realms. We have, you know, two uh, community members who just talked to me this morning about quitting their jobs. And Dave, who's here filming, recollected or reflected that He's never seen people so willing to quit their jobs as this community. So I feel like we're not helping the American co economy too much. But, uh, <laughs> but sometimes opanayiko means leading inwards. It means stopping and coming to our own hearts. And often we miss that switch. Which meaning of opanayiko is this moment correct for? Is it another moment of leading outwards or do we need to stop? and humbly listen to what's in our own hearts right now. And a huge part of this is, is anger, because we are far more angry than we realize. And who could blame us after being frustrated by the world, which we've looked to for refuge for how many years? And continually, it does disappoint. There is a bright, thread of Dhamma that runs through the world, which does not disappoint, but many of us have only begun to touch that thread. And even when we do, it frays and sometimes slips from our grasp. So acknowledging that anger, honestly, is a bit more the baseline state for many of us, and humbly approaching loving kindness, not as this bright, radiant state right off the bat, although there's a place for that, but rather what the Buddha often referred to as the path was the path of adosa, non-anger. Just learning how to put down anger. And it's interesting, some people were listening to uh, or recollecting that there was a BBC radio special in, uh, in England several decades ago or years ago where they had different religious leaders speak about anger. And the Dalai Lama was there, and he was the only religious leader who said that there was never a place for anger on the path. This is our standard as Buddhists, is there is a difference between repression and suppression. We can see anger, we can acknowledge it, but we never act on it. It's never skillful to act on anger. And that is not a, an invitation to a blind passivity, but rather a invitation to look at our own state of heart and mind and take action from a place that responds rather than reacts. So this is beautifully embodied. Um, as we learn of, to work with anger, there are you know, a few really useful tools. Um, one is to work on calming the anger in the body. Another is to look at the source or the catalyst for that anger as a teacher. Another is to just develop this aspect of loving kindness. Another is to look at the good side of whoever is catalyzing that anger. And another is to understand conditionality with regard to that person's past. 
And finally, there's the aspects of how we restrain the expression when the time comes. So beginning with that restraint, one of the beautiful rules in the monk's vinaya is that you have to fulfill five conditions before you're allowed to admonish another monk. You have to ask and receive permission from that monk. You have to, and this goes for all monastics, bhikkhunis and bhikkhus. You have to speak from a mind of loving kindness. And there, I know one uh, monk who waited a whole year before he could fulfill that criteria. You have to speak free from fault yourself. And uh, you have to speak honestly and speak at a timely, in a timely fashion at the right time. So in monasteries, for example, you don't talk to someone before the morning meal. And this level of restraint means that because you know that when you approach a conversation with even that sliver of anger, it changes everything, the whole flavor. And that ability and that duty as Buddhists, as practitioners of the spiritual path, regardless of denomination, to stop and to sit in the fire as you know, the venerables who joined us several weeks ago uh, articulated. And this is why the Buddha said patient endurance was the supreme incinerator of defilement, is learning to sit in that fire and not express anger or vent your spleen and wait until you can, and if you have to excuse yourself from a situation, that's fine, but then to reapproach it later and speak out of care. And there really is a way of doing that. Another way of uh, approaching anger um, and working with it is to really reflect on the drawbacks of anger. So the Buddha said that the comic result of often being angry was that one is reborn ugly. Uh, one said that there's a list of three kinds of minds he gives. Uh, one is the mind like an oozing sore. And this is the angry mind where when it's pressed even a little, it spurts out pus. So if that's not an image that will keep you from kind of spurting out what you want to say, then I don't know what will. The second kind of mind is a mind like a lightning bolt, which is the mind that sees in a flash of light the Four Noble Truths and attains stream entry, the first stage of awakening. And the third kind of mind is the mind of a diamond, an arahant, that can cut anything and is absolutely pure. So I think we all know which of those we'd appreciate more than the others. The Buddha also speaks about how to look at the drawbacks of anger in uh, a sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya called the Vitaka Santana Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 20. And he says that just as a beautiful man, young man or woman would be horrified and disgusted at the corpse of a child or a snake or a dog hung around their neck. Even so, one should feel horrified and disgusted at these harbored thoughts of ill will, of, uh, of cruelty, of all these negative states. So that's some intense imagery for you. But I think that idea of what anger looks like, what it feels like, is it's a good recollection, and it keeps us from buying into it. And often we know the drawback of anger. We know its ugliness, and yet we can't give it up. And there really this, is this temptation to try to, say, spread loving kindness to the person who we're angry at. And often it's just not possible. And in moments like that, I think it's really useful to turn our loving kindness back on ourselves and just realize how much it hurts to be angry, how painful it is, and, and acknowledge it doesn't really matter who you're spreading loving kindness to, but sometimes there's a real place in that fire of anger just to hold yourself with compassion. That's where the loving kindness is appropriately uh, oriented. There's a, a great list of four qualities of mind which are universally arise with every negative mind state, and that's ignorance, uh, lack of conscience, lack of concern, and restlessness. And someone was reflecting on alms round earlier this week that what that means is that if you hamstring even one of those four factors, you hamstring the entire negative state. So if you bring up that sense of uh, shame, 
wholesome shame, respect for yourself, knowing that expressing this anger, giving into it is beneath you. Uh, or recollecting one of these images of what it would look like, what the anger looks like in you. Uh, that sense of wholesome respect for oneself can touch and dampen that whole sensation of anger right away. Or maybe that fourth uh, accompanying universal state um, called the chetasika of restlessness is the one that you can hamstring. Because often the reason we express anger is because there's a sense of built up energy. And just learning to get rid of that, to um, relax the restlessness. So Ajahn Suchita says, when you're angry, power up, power up right down into your feet, which can help. Or you can place awareness into your elbows because your elbows are rarely angry. Elbows are pretty ne neutral places. Or if you sort of, if you learn to become skilled at using this breath energy that we sort of touched this morning in meditation and circulating it up the spine and down the front of the body, then this block and this feeling of pent up energy can dissipate and calm. The other approach is to try to bring the mind to good, the good qualities of someone. So there's a beautiful sutta called the Agatavinya Sutta, where the Buddha says that one should approach a person impure in bodily acts, but pure of speech, as they would a man would a cloth lying on the ground. And using one foot to tear off the dirty part of the cloth, he would pick up the clean part. One should approach someone of impure acts of speech, but pure acts of body, as a person would approach a pond covered with algae. And carefully clearing the algae off the surface of the pond, that person would bend down and drink from the cool water. One should approach a person of impure acts of speech and impure acts of body, but with occasional moments of clarity and mindfulness. As one would, a thirsty man would appro approach a hoof print filled with water and bending his lips to the water would sip carefully so as to be careful to not disturb the silt. One should approach someone of impure verbal and bodily action and without occasional moments of clarity and mindfulness, as one would approach someone starving, sick in the desert. And finally, one should approach one of pure bodily and verbal conduct and with mindfulness and clarity as one would approach a cool oasis. The profundity of the Buddha's teaching touches me every time. And this idea that we pick what is good in people when we're able, that's what we focus on and that's what we speak about. And if there's that gossip who wants to talk about the bad qualities of someone, then it's okay to pull back. Or you can use skillful means. So there are gossipy monks out there. And with one of my spiritual friends who does tend to gossip a little bit, uh, what I told him was, look, I'm really trying not to speak about others behind their back. Would you help me with that? And you don't have to say that it's you who you're trying to help me with, but they'll, get, they'll pick up on something. Long Popasno is, is famous for not saying anything uh, or, or, or not gossiping at all. And St. Teresa of Avila took the vow in her life to never say something about another that she wouldn't say in front of them. There are times where that can be put down for the sake of speaking uh, about a danger or something that really needs to be talked about, a concern about another. But you can constrain those moments by saying, look, I usually don't speak about others in this way, but I need to say something. And just put it out there in a skillful way and then stop. This is our duty, I think, as a community, what we're cultivating.
the other way the Buddha spoke about working uh, with someone one had aversion to, and this is another numerical discourse is in the Book of the Fives, is he said one should work with someone who one is angry at first by trying to spread metta, then spreading compassion, then equanimity. And you'll notice that he manages to skip over mudita, sympathetic joy, because that's a lot to ask with people you're just really angry at. He says, then you can reflect that they're, uh, you can reflect, you cannot bring them to mind. And this is a revelation in, you know, modern circles that you don't have to confront and power your way through every relationship and difficult recollection in your heart. Some things are just too close and you can just not bring them to mind for a time. So one uh, encouragement Ajahn Sona gives is if there is a person like that who just can't bring up wholesome states with regards to them, uh, write their name on a piece of paper, put it in an envelope, and put it in a drawer for six months and just determine that you won't think about them until the six months are over. And then bring that name out at the end of that and see where you're at. Ajahn Sona also says that if you can't spread metta to someone, spread it to their chair. I think that's very good. And then finally in that sutta, he says, you reflect that they're the owners of their kama. One of the most powerful tools the Buddha gives us for dealing with anger is to look at conditionality. And so much of dukkha, suffering, stress, and anger is the feeling like things should not be like this. And yet when we, if we really knew anyone's history, we could never be angry at them. We've all had that experience of learning about someone's childhood and being like, oh, of course they're like that. And this is the bridge to compassion. A good metaphor is, you know, wandering around in a grocery store and then someone bumping up behind you and knocking your groceries on the ground and you turn and see that they're blind and whatever anger there was there suddenly disappears. And similarly, we're all just sort of blind people with groceries bumping into one another here. And that's okay. The only normal people among us, the only ones who see are the arahants. The rest of us are just trying. And to understand conditionality like this, is meaningful and it's a powerful route to compassion because whenever the buddha speaks about the 12 links of conditionality this unbelievably complex system of psychology he always or often he'll pair it with this idea that this is the thusness of dhamma the not otherwiseness of dhamma that is this that conditionality and the word for that in pali of thusness is ta 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 and you can see how the Buddha is pointing almost onomatopoeically to the sense of settling and rightness and groundedness in that knowledge of how things came to be. When you understand that the person who has been hurting you and bringing suffering, or so you thought, into your life, when you understand that their parent abused them or how they were hurt in their own way, the sense of of course, ta ta ta, the settling. This is the drum of the deathless. It's the utter simplicity, that rightness of alignment that the Buddha pairs with the most complex psychological system, I think, that, that we've been given in our past. And the Other really way, useful way of working with anger that I've valued is in the Mahayana, there's a conception of a bodhisattva. And the bodhisattvas, they say, um, in this mythology, can split their minds into emanation bodies, which manifest on earth to teach us as people, as the drunk on the side of the street, as a boss, or even as situations. So can we really turn towards those difficulties in our lives as teachers, as bodhisattvas? And uh, I know many um, people who took certain political leaders who they disliked and took a picture of them and put it on their shrine, below the Buddha, but on their shrine, and bowed to them every morning as instructors and patients. And there's one community member whose 
partner did not like this, so she uh, designated her teddy bear as this political leader and put him on the shrine instead. And I think maybe held him at night too. It's very sweet. So, and I lived with one, I've spoken about this many times, but I lived with a monk for a time who would admonish me about everything, how I closed the door um, and more. And what was just an annoying monk getting on my case, when I thought about how grateful I'd be if a senior teacher took that level of attention to me and refined my behavior in that way, what a teaching it would be, um, that was why wouldn't I hold that person like that and take it as a teaching? So that was my year. It was meditation, uh, and then it was this monk. And that was an, a hugely beneficial part of my practice, and we've departed as good friends and brothers. So, and it's not often enough with those deep moments of suffering or those people to just say, okay, I should make them part of my practice. With that spouse, that parent, that partner, that child, you have to turn completely to them and bow to them, metaphorically in many cases, as your first noble truth. There's a reason the word noble is there, because you have to orient yourself completely and humbly towards it in order for it to work. Take the dirtiest place in your life and make it the cleanest. That's Ajahn Yannicko's whole practice, he says. He'll go find a place in the workshop and clean it and make it the cleanest. And that's what we do in our lives. Wherever your first noble truth of suffering is, that's where you'll find peace and all the other three. And finally, just developing love day to day. Right when you wake up, you'll find the mind wants to crystallize around anger and instead give it loving kindness for the first five minutes right away and that'll pay dividends. Develop the boundless states at least 10 minutes a day or if every meditation if you can of loving kindness, compassion, uh, sympathetic joy, equanimity, equipoise, a grandmother's love. And these are boundless in so many ways, but one of the ways is that they spread beyond us, beyond the meditation, and infuse our life with a deep potency and power. But they all begin humbly here in our own bruised, imperfect, and angry hearts. And yet what we come to, if we're able to restrain that, is the spaciousness of the open palm of uh, this invitation of a community like this, where there's this sense of safety that people here will not speak about you behind their back. They will not hurt you. They will not take from you. They will not lie to you. That is what we are cultivating. And this community and this aspiration will be, will succeed only insofar as we manage to hold to that standard as as a community. And uh, I don't think we have donuts today, but we do have something special. Um, and I think that'll be enough for now. So I wish you all the best on this journey.